when we're analyzing flow over a blunt body, there's going to be two kinds of forces that we care about, broadly speaking. Uh, we're going to resolve the net force on the body into, so first let's draw our body here. We're going to resolve the net force onto the body into a uh, lift force, FL, and a drag force, FD. And drag is going to act parallel to the flow. So drag force is the component of net force uh, that acts parallel to the flow. Drag force is the component of the net force that acts parallel to the flow. And the lift force is the component of force that acts um, uh, normal to the direction of flow. Normal to the flow. So you can think, add up all of the forces acting on this body, you can resolve that into one net force vector. And, um, and you would do that by integrating the pressure field over the surface area. And then you can take that vector and break it up into components that are aligned with the flow and components that are orthogonal to the flow. Stuff that's aligned with the flow is drag. Stuff that is orthogonal to the flow is going to be um, uh, lift. And we're going to deal with lift later in the course when we discuss airfoils. But uh, for now, we're going to focus on the drag force. Um, and one thing I should say is that when these forces um, uh, are applied to a gas, we call them aerodynamic forces. And for a liquid, they are hydrodynamic forces. Okay, and uh, some important expressions that we're going to deal with in this uh, in this uh, week's module are these uh, drag coefficient forces. So we've got CD, which is a non-dimensional drag coefficient, which is going to be equal to the drag force normalized by uh, half rho u a rho u squared a. <clears throat> as well as a lift force, which very similarly is just equal to lift force over half rho u squared a. So these equations are very important. Um, and uh, the way that you use them as you're becoming familiar with uh, this process, you're becoming familiar with this process uh, through ME 320 and also in this class, is that we like to tabulate things as engineers. So we do simulations, we do experiments, we do measurements, and then we come up with non-dimensional numbers that can be used by other engineers in a more active design context. But here, let's say I wanna know the drag force and I happen to know CD, I simply can calculate an expression that looks like this. Uh, the drag force is equal to half times CD rho u squared A, and A is gonna be a characteristic area So perhaps it would be the area of the sphere. Uh, U is gonna be a characteristic velocity. So maybe the inflow velocity. And then someone would have done experiments and they would say for that velocity and for that area, uh, for whatever kind of object that you're dealing with, you can look up a value of CD. And if you look up that value of CD and input it here, uh, then you're going to get uh, a value of drag. But the key thing is that this coefficient is empirical. Meaning that virtually we are virtually always, but not, not literally always, but virtually always deriving this from simulations or experiments and we're not computing it by hand. 
uh, or I should say we're not predicting it uh, by hand calculations. Um, so it's usually going to be a complex phenomena that arises out of a specific geometric and flow field configuration. Um, but one thing that's important to know about the relative effects of these forces is um, how they behave in some limiting cases. So we're going to consider a flat plate, uh, as we do somewhat often, in two different configurations. So first, let's look at a flat plate that is held up like so, the flat plate on the left here. And if I hold up my hand when I'm driving, or you're the passenger, I guess, should maybe keep your hand in the car if you're driving, but if you're the passenger and you hold up your hand, uh, you're going to feel different forces if you're depending on the direction of your hand based on the relative flow. So if I have my hand up like this, what's gonna happen is that the flow field is going to produce a very large wake. You're gonna have a very huge region where uh, the flow separates and a large pressure gradient and you feel it pulling you back much more strongly than if it's like this, uh, if you're in the flat orientation. So we'll note that we have a, uh, a large wake but also we're going to have low friction. Why is that? Because the force friction is only applying on these two flat surfaces here. So low friction. Um, in the flat plate case, we're gonna have quite a limited wake region. We might have, even if we have viscous flow, those boundary layers that we've been talking about are quite small. And if the plate is thin, then you might have almost no flow profile over that uh, plate. So you're going to get you know, some sort of a flow that looks like this, just kind of hugging the plate. And you'll get boundary layers in here. Um, and oh, what's going on? Sorry, one second. You'll get some boundary layers. Should be able to recover this. Okay, so we're going to have boundary layers um, and we're going to have a very uh, small wake, negligibly small almost. So we'll have a small wake, but very large friction. And so that friction force is gonna apply over the whole surface in this case. So we have a long time to get drag over the plate. So you're going to have a lot of drag force, but not a lot of uh, not a lot of uh, of uh, what we'll call a pressure drag, which we'll get into shortly. Um, or actually, we did introduce it in the last lecture. So uh, we can draw a chart that kind of illustrates what's going on here. If we look at oops, if we look at sort of these CD coefficients, um, then we might transition from the plate geometry being uh, vertical to the plate geometry being horizontal. So let's call this theta and let's look at CD. And then we will have a pressure force, which is going to be going down as we increase the theta. So the pressure difference from the front and the back, that's gonna be going down as we go to a flat plate because uh, you have very small wake, very uh, uh, very limited effects due to reattachment of the flow together. Uh, but we'll also have a drag force, or sorry, a friction force, which goes up. So we've got friction and pressure. And we can look up these kinds of coefficients for this sort of scenario. And you'll notice that you might have a minimum force acting kind of in that region. So you wanna consider both of these sources of forces on your uh, plate due to drag and they're different forces. And the force we discussed in the past lecture was a pressure uh, drag force, which is brought about by the difference in pressure uh, from the front and the back um, due to the loss of momentum over the flow. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'll show you a couple more examples here. Um, that kind of emphasize points from the previous lecture. So if we plot CD 
not as a function of geometry now, uh, but as a function of Reynolds number. Uh, if we look at that flat plate, the drag coefficient on this plate is basically constant. So the drag force is gonna go quite a bit up because as we follow the Reynolds number, we're going to get larger and larger forces on that uh, object. But that non-dimensional drag coefficient stays constant. So the effects of drag are uh, just directly proportional to, uh, to u, u squared to, in this case. And um, however, as we change the shape, we're gonna get some different effects. So if we look at a sphere, instead, which was the body that we we're dealing with uh, earlier, then we're going to get a coefficient that looks kind of like this. And if we look at an airfoil, just to give one more example, you know, we've designed this to have much less uh, drag. And so we're going to get an overall drag coefficient, which looks like this. But uh, so the point of this previous graph is that we are going to have different components of drag we can consider the net drag to get an overall drag coefficient. And that drag coefficient is gonna depend on the shape of the object that we're looking at and also the flow conditions. And what I'll just note here is that these little humps that I drew are due to the transition to turbulence. Which we also discussed in the previous lecture uh, where we had a turbulent wake uh, at causing a relative decrease in the overall drag at the outset. But again, as you would increase Reynolds more and more and more, the overall uh, drag force can go up. So these lines are going down, but they're not necessarily going down greater than the uh, increase in the overall force due to the increase in velocity that's causing the Reynolds number to go up. Because the increase in force is going up as u squared, the increase in Reynolds is going up as u. Um, so uh, the last thing I would like to show you in this sort of second mini component of the lecture here is a neat application of these forces, uh, which is to say we can look at that creep flow case, which was very special. And this is one of those cases where we can actually just give a very nice clean expression of what the drag force will be. And so for the Reynolds number, uh, less than or equal to one, we're going to have CD equals to 24 over the Reynolds number. And this is gonna be purely frictional drag, which is why we can give such a nice expression. That means that the pressure is the same on either end of the sphere because we have quasi reattachment and we're basically almost dealing with an inviscid case when the flow is that slow. So we have purely frictional drag. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that expression for FD that we developed above. So FD is half CD rho u squared A, and we're gonna substitute in this expression. And uh, the reason why is gonna be relevant to measuring vis viscosity. We wanna describe what's going on to a sphere that is dropping relatively slowly in some sort of a liquid. So we're going to have FD is equal to half uh, CD rho U squared A. And in this case, CD is equal to 24 over re D. Re D is equal to uh, rho U D over mu. And uh, the area is going to be equal to pi D squared over four, and I will note for later that the volume is gonna be pi d cubed over six. So if we substitute this in, we're gonna have half uh, 24 over re d rho u squared times uh, pi d squared over four. And we can substitute in our Reynolds numbers. We're gonna have half uh, 24 mu, over uh, rho u times rho u squared. Oh, I'm missing a d here. Pi d squared over four. Now, of course, the uh, the rho u is going to cancel with one of these rho u's. 
uh, and we're going to be able to simplify our expression in terms of the uh, the numbers that we have. So we can take 24 over two is gonna be 12, and then we divide by three, and we're going to get um, three over all. So we divide by four, we're gonna get three. So we are going to have an expression that looks like this. We're gonna have FD is equal to three pi mu du. And this is a very famous and important expression known as Stokes law. So why do we care about Stokes law? Stokes law is in George Stokes of the Navier Stokes equations. So here we have Stokes law. And the fact that we can write out this expression for drag at low speeds means that uh, we can take advantage of a phenomenon. If we have a pipe here, we've got some sort of fluid in the pipe and we have a sphere dropping inside this pipe. Uh, just falling free, then at the terminal velocity, FD, the drag forces are balanced with the gravitational forces. So FD is equal to FG, the force of gravitation, which is going to be equal to four pi r cubed over three, which is equal to pi d squared over uh, three, over six, sorry, uh, times the gravity constant times the density of the fluid minus, sorry, the density of the ball minus the density of the fluid times the density of the ball, rho ball minus rho fluid, which we can call this delta rho. And uh, if you substitute everything in, what you can do is you can get an expression by combining these equations and you can solve for mu. So mu is going to be equal to uh, d squared over 18 times g delta rho over u. Now, why is that interesting? Uh, this device is what we call a viscometer. And if you take a viscometer, you drop a ball in the viscometer, you observe terminal velocity. By Stokes' law, you can equate the drag and gravitational forces, and you can take that observed velocity and the known properties of the fluid and the ball, like the density, which you can get by just weighing it. And this is a way to actually measure uh, the viscosity of the flow, which is a very cool device. Uh, so these are that's just an example of one of the ways that we can take advantage of these expressions and of understanding the forces acting uh, in between a bluff body and a fluid in order to analyze fluid behavior uh, in a scientific way. Uh, and in the next lecture, we're going to look at how some of the dynamic forces balance in the equations so that we'll be able to analyze the results in the simulation portion of this module.